Hello and welcome to Close Reading Classic Literature with me, Dr Octavia Cox. What is negative capability? It is something that the poet John Keats considered to be essential to his poetic style as well as his conception of truth. But what does negative capability actually mean? And how does it materialise within John Keats's poetry itself? In this video, I'm going to explain what John Keats meant by the term negative capability. And then I'm going to analyse it in relation to a poem of John Keats's Lamia, and in particular, his description of a rainbow. John Keats's phrase, negative capability, appeared in a letter to his brothers from about the 27th of December, 1817. So first I'm going to read through the text of the letter and then I'm going to unpick it and analyse it in a bit more detail. So this is the text itself. So Charles Brown and Charles Wentworth Dilk. Brown and Dilk walked with me and back from the Christmas pantomime. I had not a dispute, but a disquisition with Dilk on various subjects. Several things dovetailed in my mind and at once it struck me what quality went to form a man of achievement, especially in literature, and which Shakespeare possessed so enormously. I mean negative capability. That is, when a man is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. This is Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Coleridge, for instance, would let go by a fine, isolated, verisimilitude caught from the penetralium of mystery from being incapable of remaining content with half-knowledge. This, pursued through volumes, would perhaps take us no further than this, that with a great poet, the sense of beauty overcomes every other consideration, or rather, obliterates all consideration. So what does Keats mean here by the term negative capability when he says I mean negative capability? Well the first thing I think to point out is what the implications are of the word negative. So negative here I think means, and this is the Oxford English Dictionary definition, this is the version of negative that means consisting in, characterised by or expressing the absence rather than the presence of distinguishing features. So Keats does not use the word negative here in a derogatory sense, but rather to convey the idea that a person's abilities can be defined by what he or she does not possess just as much as they can be by what someone does possess. So negative capability or kind of absent capability. So negative capability, we might say then, is a capability of absence. But absence of what? That a person does not possess a need, a desire, an urge, a determination to figure everything out. So as the sentence continues, I mean negative capability, that is, when a man is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. So the absence there is the absence of that sense of reaching, reaching after. So does the person who's in a state of negative capability is not irritably reaching after fact and reason, and that's what's absent. I think we should also note here the kind of double meaning or the, the dual potential meanings of the word irritable. So there are two senses. The first is a kind of uh, definition that we probably would expect, which is kind of readily excited to anger or impatience or annoyance. But there's also a kind of medical uh, understanding of the term to mean kind of extraordinarily sensitive and extremely responsive to stimulus. So this medical kind of 
understanding of the term is defined by the Oxford English Dictionary as excessively or morbidly, that means kind of unhealthily, excitable or sensitive. So it's kind of sensitive to an unhealthy degree. And remember that Keats was qualified medically and he had even progressed to the stage of training uh, where he was training as a surgeon at Guy's Hospital in London. Um, and he had been training for a very long time. He was first apprenticed uh, to an apothecary when he was 14, uh, and that's in 1810. So by this time, he'd been in medical training for, for a long time before giving it all up to become a poet. But part of that training, that medical training, included dissecting rotting corpses. So Keats had seen the inside of human bodies, human rotting bodies. So the, the facts of the human body might be known, you know, when you're doing a dissection, that this t tissue connects to that tissue and this nerve is here and that blood vessel is there and, you know, where the electric impulses go and where they're from. Um, and so on. And you can reach after all those facts. And yet, there is still the mystery of the life of that body, that soul, its spirit. The idea that you can dissect a body all you like, but you, you still won't understand its soul. I think that sort of dichotomy that runs throughout Keats's poetry of the kind of spiritual side, the mystery side, coupled with this very, you know, kind of scientific training that he had as a kind of medical uh, professional. And those two run hand in hand quite often. So this, this word irritable then, I think we should take the kind of medical um, background to that word. Um, in our understanding of the term uh, negative capability and that idea of irritable reaching after fact and reason. So as a whole then, this sentence and the kind of preceding it, so the idea of the man of achievement, Shakespeare uh, especially, what Keats is saying is that essential to literary achievement is an accepting willingness to let what is uncertain, mysterious, doubtful, remain in that state. And to revere those unknowns. Keats then continues in the letter, Coleridge, for instance, would let go by a fine, isolated verisimilitude. And verisimilitude uh, here means the appearance of truth. So a fine, isolated verisimilitude is a beautiful, singular, truth-feeling thing. So we'd let go by a fine, isolated verisimilitude caught from the pelotralium of mystery. So caught, so that's an interesting choice of diction for Keats to use there. The word caught, there is a suggestion of kind of receiving. So the receiving of the beautiful truth, thought, feeling, and almost as though it's accidental, I happened to catch it. You can only sort of happen to catch something that happens to be near you or happens to come by you. And you are, as I've said, on the kind of receiving end of catching something. So you catch a ball, but that ball has to have been thrown either by you or by somebody else, but it has to have been thrown and be coming towards you in order for you to be able to catch it. Or if you catch the end of a conversation that somebody else is having, or, you know, dare I say it at the moment, you, you catch a cold. Um, so it's so this sort of idea of it, it just kind of happening, that, you know, this fine isolated verisimilitude would let go by a fine isolated ver verisimilitude. So as if it's sort of coming towards him and Coleridge would just let it, this beautiful truth thought, he would just let it continue. He wouldn't try and catch it from the penetralium of mystery. Um, 
penetralium, it, it, the innermost or the most secret part of something, the penetralium of mystery. And this is the um, second time that Keats has used, used the word mystery just in this short passage. So we should note then in this repetition of diction that obviously the, the kind of idea of mystery is important to Keats here in this idea of negative capability. So Coleridge would let go by this beautiful truth thought and wouldn't try and catch it from being incapable of remaining content with half knowledge. So negative capability is the ability to sort of let it go, to be kind of absent. Whereas Coleridge is incapable of remaining content with half knowledge. So it's the kind of opposite of negative capability, whereas Coleridge is sort of positively incapable <laughs> of, of being in this sort of state of appreciating mystery. So what does this whole kind of sentence mean in relation to Coleridge then? So Keats suggests that his fellow romantic poet and philosopher, kind of importantly, and, and he was known for his thinking and his theorising as much as for his poetry in, in his own lifetime, Samuel Tyler Coleridge Keats argues, should desist from his kind of relentless quest for full, complete knowledge. So earlier in that year, in July 1817, Coleridge had published his Biographia Literaria, so his literary biography, the, the history of his reading, in which Coleridge had opined, for example, that philosophy in its highest sense is the science of ultimate truths and therefore scientia scientiarum. So the, the science of science or the knowledge of knowledge. Instead, Keats argues, one, and Coleridge in particular, should contemplate what strikes one as beautiful, singular and true, a fine, isolated, verisimilitude, caught, as I've said, as if by accident from the most secret part, the penetralium of mystery. Coleridge, conversely, seeks ultimate truths. So ultimate meaning final, end, absolute, complete, overarching. This sort of drive to unify, this drive to find the ultimate truth kind of behind behind any particular individual truth to find the kind of ultimate truths that um, are a kind of umbrella or a, the foundational truths is another way perhaps of thinking of it. So Keats instead is saying that actually one should kind of value and appreciate, accept, be content with the singleness or isolatedness of a beautiful truth that strikes one without immediately trying to unify it into a, a whole, a grand unified system, theory, philosophy of knowledge, to be content with not knowing. Keats's letter continues, this pursued through volumes would perhaps take us no further than this that with a great poet, the sense of beauty, the sense, it's a really important word for Keats. He talks about wanting to live a life of sensations rather than thoughts. And it's sense that's important for appreciating beauty. And beauty means um, kind of awe, sublimity, not just surface kind of prettiness, surface beauty, but the a real kind of profound sense of beauty, a profound kind of experience rather than a sort of trivial, a trivial kind of prettiness. So this sense of beauty rather than a knowledge of beauty or a thought of beauty or a kind of reasoned understanding of beauty. Instead, in the word sense, we have this idea of it being an impression, of it being an instinct 
of it being perception, of it being intuition. And that's what's important, that it kind of strikes the inside. This beauty strikes the inside feeling, the sense, rather than the brain necessarily. So with a, with a great poet, the sense of beauty overcomes every other consideration or rather obliterates all consideration. So for a great poet, it is this inner perception and sensation of beauty that overcomes, that trumps, that supersedes all consideration. So all thought, all contemplation, this sense of beauty and it's a kind of trust of the innate and the trust of the kind of internal eye if you like and that that should for a great poet that should supersede knowledge facts reason philosophy and it you know it even goes so far as to obliterate them it's a very strong word there you know that it it makes everything else a sense of beauty makes everything else disappear. For Keats then, an intuitive appreciation and perception of the beautiful is central to poetic genius and renders irrelevant anything that is determined through reason. Being in a state of negative capability then is being in a state of receptive passiveness. So less than two months after the negative capability letter of about the 27th of December 1817, Keats would write to his friend John Hamilton Reynolds, and this is on the 19th of February 1818, that it is more noble to sit like Jove. So Jove is another name for Jupiter, who was the Roman god of the sky. It is more noble to sit like Jove than to fly like Mercury. In Roman mythology, Mercury was the messenger of the gods, the, the fleet-footed messenger of the gods. Let us not, therefore, go hurrying about and collecting, honey bee-like, buzzing here and there impatiently from a knowledge of what is to be arrived at, but let us open our leaves like a flower and be passive and receptive budding patiently under the eye of Apollo, Apollo, god of poetry, and taking hints from every noble insect that favours us with a visit. So rather than being like a bee and being the, the, the kind of buzzing creature that goes from flower to flower, um, kind of impatiently, uh, irritably reaching after um, nectar, Instead of, of being the uh, kind of moving creature, Keats is suggesting actually it would be better to be like the flower, to open yourself up, to be passive and receptive to any insect who wants to kind of come along to you and favour you with a visit. And being kind of open and receptive to receiving kind of whatever beautiful thing it is that is sort of brought to you by those insects that come to you. Keats suggests that there is a different kind of knowledge, a greater understanding of what is important in the world that can be obtained through awake, we might say, or receptive passivity and being kind of open to receiving um, beauty from from kind of externally being open to it coming to you. And in this suggestion, Keats aligns with William Wordsworth's conception of wise passiveness, which is from Wordsworth's poem, Expostulation and Reply, which was published in the Lyrical Ballads from 1798. And this is the lines, these are the lines. We can feed this mind of ours in a wise passiveness. We can feed this mind of ours. You know, that, that you can be kind of sustained. You can feed your own mind, your own sort of internal being with wise 
passiveness and being open to kind of receiving what happens to come to you rather than searching out knowledge kind of letting it letting it nurture within you um, for Keats then as for Wordsworth there is wisdom in a kind of this state of awake passivity and wisdom is a very different kind of knowledge you might say from facts and reason you know that them that there there is something perhaps more um th more thoughtful more profound in the idea of wisdom than the idea of kind of collecting facts um and it's an awake passivity because you are aware that there is a mystery. You are aware that you don't know everything. You are aware that you only have half knowledge. So you're, it's a kind of awake passivity because you're awake to the mystery. You're not, you're not dead to the fact that there is mystery. You understand that there is mystery, but you are happy, content to appreciate to feel that mystery. So it's a higher, perhaps, as I've said, more profound kind of engagement with the world than what irritably reaching after facts and reason can bring. And it's kind of within your ken when you are in a state of negative capability. I'm now going to consider an example of negative capability in action in John Keats's poetry from these this kind of beautiful image, this beautiful lines um, from the poem Lamia, which was published in the 1820 volume. Do not all charms fly at the mere touch of cold philosophy. There was an awful rainbow once in heaven. So awful here meaning awe inspiring. There was an awe inspiring rainbow once in heaven. We know her worth, so her kind of texture, her woven texture, her texture. So a woof is a, is a kind of wove to, woven fabric. So we know her worth, her texture. She is given in the dull catalogue of common things. Philosophy will clip an angel's wings. Conquer all mysteries by line and rule. Empty the haunted air and nomad mine, unweave a rainbow. So negative capability, is, as we've established, is being comfortable, even content, uh, with being in a state of mystery, of uncertainty. But now, even something as magical, as divine, as otherworldly, as a rainbow, has been made dull by other people's desire to reach after the facts of rainbows, to catalogue the particulars of them. And this is a reference to Isaac Newton's scientific experiments in the, uh, with light in the late 17th and early 18th centuries, which was published in 1704 as Optics or a treatise of the reflections, refractions, inflections and colours of light. For Keats, such cold, irritable reaching to conquer all mysteries by rule and line, by fact and reason, destroys some of the sense of beauty, the sublimity, the awe of the rainbow. And note the diction again, um, this is drawing on, it seems, the negative capability letter itself, where the word mystery was twice repeated. And again, we have mystery being brought in specifically to Lamia, conquering all mysteries. But Keats wants to celebrate mystery. So in this passage from Lamia, Keats suggests that there is no need to conquer mystery, the sense of beauty, the, the mystery of beauty, of the rainbow, 
there is no need for an antagonistic relationship with mystery or uncertainty, that it would be better just to allow the mysteries of the rainbow to remain. And that you, you lose what's magical, what's special, what's awe-inspiring about it, if all you focus on are the facts of the rainbow. You know, the facts of the rainbow, Keats is saying, are not what is profound. You know, do not all charms fly at the touch of cold philosophy that, you know, what about the charms? Why can't we appreciate the charms of, of mystery, of these things that we don't understand, but that strike us? The sense of beauty is kind of profound, even if we don't know all the little particulars. And a, a, a good friend of Keats, Benjamin Robert Hayden, the painter, held a dinner party on the night of the 28th of December, 1817. And this would go on to be known as the Immortal Dinner uh, because the guests included Keats and also William Wordsworth and Hayden and uh, Charles Lamb and others. And, you know, this is at the very kind of time, this Immortal Dinner Party happens at the, the very kind of time that Keats is birthing this idea of negative capability, so in late December 1817. And Hayden recorded in his diary account of that evening that Keats agreed he, Isaac Newton, had destroyed all the poetry of the rainbow by reducing it to a prison. Thank you very much indeed for watching. Remember, if you like what I do here on my channel where I analyse classic literature, then do subscribe. And if you have liked the video, then do please press the thumbs up button. It helps me out in YouTube's algorithm. And do you have any of your own striking examples of negative capability from Keats's poetry or any other poetry even? If you do, then leave them in the comments below.